Shabbat Shalom. We are in uh, Torah portion Pinchas. We are in Bain HaMetzarim, the three weeks of, um, I don't know what to call it, three weeks of terror, I don't know what to call it, three weeks that are bad, three weeks of heat, three weeks of the, the heat demons being let loose. It's a kind of a dangerous time, you've got to be very, very careful, don't be out in the heat uh, if, you, if you can help it, um, and uh, it's, it's not a time when we win, it's a time when we lose, it's a time when the demons win actually, believe it or not, and um, it's between the 17th of Tammuz, when the Romans broke through the wall, and the uh, 9th of Av, when both the Romans and the Babylonians destroyed the temples, more than 550 years apart on the same day. So it's, it's a tough time. You just got to be very, very careful. So that's where we're at. Now, what, what we're going to talk about today is Pinchas. We're going to talk about Pinchas. And, um, whoops. I hate to start the teaching out by shattering mythology, but I have to in order to actually talk about what I want to talk about, we have to be on the same page. And in order to get us on the same page, I have to, have to talk about a couple things that are, that are uh, inappropriate that need to be fixed. Now, what, what I'm going to talk about with Pinchas is how to feel what God feels. How to feel what God feels. And um, I, asked, I asked some people, like, if you had to... If somebody asked you, how can I feel what God feels? How can I know I'm feeling the same thing that God is feeling? And I didn't get any satisfying responses. I've asked this for years and years, and I never get a satisfying response, to be honest. And, um, but there is a way to not only feel what God feels, but know that you're feeling what God feels at the same time that he's feeling it. And that's the trick. To know what you're doing and to know why you're doing it. Um, there's this song in Christian circles that I don't know very well because it's been many years since I did it. The zeal of God has consumed me deep in my soul, a flaming fire that keeps burning cannot be controlled. I, I don't know the rest. That's all I remember. Well, you know, we used to sing that song uh, years and years ago. The zeal of God has consumed me deep in my soul. It's like you're feeling what God is feeling. Here's the problem with that. Just like everything else, almost everything else in Christianity, it's wrong. There's no such word as zeal in the Bible. It does not exist. The word is jealousy. The, but that doesn't fit the rhythm. The jealousy of God has come. But that's what it is. And, you know, because of a lack of Hebrew knowledge, and because of a lack of knowing the Bible in its original uh, meaning from Hebrew, from Judaism, um, many people in the church have written songs that just are inappropriate. They're just inappropriate because they're using scripture in a wrong way. Here's, a, here's another one that I don't know. We've talked about this one before when we talked about the birth pangs. The zeal... No, no, I just did that one. They rush on the city, they run on the wall, for great is the army that carries out his word. They rush on the city, they run on the wall, for great is the army that carries out his word. That's the, all I know. It should be, they rush on the city, they run on the wall, the Assyrian invasion in the day of the Lord. Who wants to sing about that? So the problem is that there's a lot of music out there that is inappropriate because it, it just doesn't follow Scripture because of a lack of understanding of Scripture. Now, that's, that word, zeal, which is actually jealousy, is what we're going to key on today. So I got, I got a better song to sing about um, 
this teaching, what, what I'm going to teach about. I will write it in their heart, write it on their inward part, a covenant in forevermore by the Spirit of the Living God. I delight to do your will, O God. Your Torah in my heart today, the Torah, the Torah, I written by Spirit of God. You are a letter of Messiah, written by the finger of fire. Spirit, the Spirit of the Living God. Hesed, Behemet, mercy and truth. Have met together and love is the proof. With Torah in the heart, never be apart from the Spirit of the Living God. Hesed, Truth have met together and love is the proof. With Torah in the heart, never be apart from the spirit of the living God. I delight to do your will, O oh God. In my heart today, the Torah, the Torah, I written by the Spirit of the Living God. I will write it in their heart, write it on their inward part, a covenant forevermore by the Spirit of the Living God. That is, well, at least it gets to the heart of what I'm teaching about today. That, you know, to feel the feelings of God is a, is a difficult thing. And this guy, Pinchas, Pinchas, not Phineas, Pinchas, he felt the feelings of God. And God not only blessed him for it, but actually gave him a huge covenant. Now, before we get to um, before we get to Pinchas, we're going to go through the the history uh, from I think two Torah portions ago. We're going to go through it fairly quickly because you have to have some context where Israel is in in uh, the other side of the Jordan. You need to know where they are. You need to know who they're dealing with, and you need to know what they've been through. This is Bilam uh, or Balaam. Bilam. And he's yelling, and he's about to beat his she-ass. And she's talking to him. And here's the angel of the Lord, looking like a samurai. And here he is giving the, uh, the blessings instead of the curses over the tents of Israel. Um, I'm going to show you several things that are important. All we're going to do is hit the highlights of all this amazing stuff that this demonic... Satan worshiping sorcerer who was an amazing prophet of God isn't that strange um, said but we're just going to hit the highlights this is probably the biggest highlight Matovu Ohalecha Yaakov how beautiful are your tents O Jacob your dwelling places O Israel That's, that was said by a sorcerer whoops and we say it every Shabbat isn't that strange so, we're going to talk about how to feel what God feels. I know it sounds strange, but I think that that's what a lot of believers are after. Now, we're going to start in Kadesh. And uh, I have redone, after a lot, a lot of research, I've redone this map of the land of Edom, where Edom 
was. We know that they took up part of the Negev in the land of Canaan, in the, in the Promised Land. And I had them their land stopping before, or kind of going around Kadesh. Because, remember, Moshe and Israel said, we are at Kadesh on the border, on the, on the, on the edge of your border, Edom. So that, that's, that became a problem with the map. Um, this area here is also a problem because I don't know how much land they took and neither does anybody else. There's 57 different opinion, opinions about that. Uh, we know that they came down here in the Sinai Peninsula, which belonged to Egypt. And I discovered that they came up to the border. They came right up to the border of Moab. So I had to add that area. So no matter which way Israel moves, if they're leaving Kadesh, they've got to go through Edom territory unless they go straight east. That's really their only option. But that's not what they did. All right, so let's talk about what they did. First of all, they stayed at Kadesh. And in Kadesh, they sent out the 12 tourists or apostles, uh, shlachim, apostles, to tour the land. They were not spies. It never uses the word spy in the Bible. It used tour. It uses the word tour. They, they toured the land. Remember, the word tour is, the tur is what they say the turtle dove but it's actually the, the rock dove. And uh, it's the word for Torah. It's the same word as Torah. And while they're there at Kadesh for 38 years, because they came back to Kadesh after the tourists went out, they came back to, to Kadesh, and they stayed there for 38 years. And then comes sometime in that period, probably shortly after uh, God said, you are never going into the kingdom, the rebellion of Korach. Aaron's authority was shown because his, his uh, rod, they had 12 rods, one from each tribe, and Aaron's rod burst into a miniature almond tree to show that he was the anointed one. Um, and then right before they leave Kadesh, 38 years later, Miriam dies. She dies there at Kadesh. And then... Moses strikes the rock at Kadesh. And so it was called Meribat Kadesh because of that. So that's the history of what occurred when they were at Kadesh. Whoops. So now, there we go. Israel stays at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. It's also called the wilderness of Zin. And um, Meribat Kadesh. Then they leave Kadesh and they go to Mount Hor. It's a very, very short uh, uh, travel. It's less, less than two miles away. The entire million people travel to Mount Hor. <laughs> that means the back of the pack probably packed up all their stuff, took three steps and unpacked. I don't know. I don't know what it means. But it's a very short uh, distance. And then Edom says, you shall not pass. So, which way are they going to go? And why would they go into Israel? Because that's what they did. They went crossing a little bit of, of Edom's territory, and then more of Edom's territory in the land of Canaan, and they went into... I don't know why they're doing this. It never says why. The rabbis never say why. The Torah doesn't say why, as far as I know. Maybe there's something there that I don't know, but I, I searched and searched and couldn't find it. No rationale is given as to why Israel went into the land. I guess they thought it was time to go into the land, but it was not. They still have a year to go. They've still got that last year of travel. It's been about 39 years because they spent a, almost a year at Sinai, and then they traveled to Kadesh, and then they were there for 38 years. And so they've still got a year to go. It's going to be a bad year this last year. So when they go from Mount Hor into Canaan for some reason, Arad, who is an Amalekite, which is our biggest, worst enemy. They're at the top of the enemies of God, Amalek. I don't know if you know that. It's not Edom. 
It's not Moab. It's not the Midianites. It's Amalek. It's not the Canaanites. It's Amalek. Amalek is the number one enemy of God. It's the only people that God says you shall. Don't ever forget to wipe them off the planet. You shall not forget. All right, so the Amalekites come down, and Israel beats the Amalekites, beats them all the way back to Arad, and they rename not just Arad, but this whole area, which had several cities of, of uh, Amalekites, Horma, which means destruction. So you'd think, you know, all right, we won, we're ready to go into Israel, but they're not. They still have a year to go. Now, before they enter the land in a year, they've got a lot of things to face. And I want you to see this. They have to face five different enemies before they go into the land. We'll start from way down here in the south, Midian. Remember that Yitro, Jethro, the father-in-law of Moshe was a Midianite priest. Well, Mount Sinai is way down here. And he was the priest of God at Mount Sinai. That's where Moshe saw the burning bush because he was uh, tending to his father Yitro's flocks at Mount Sinai. And that's where the burning bush was. So that means the Midianites are all the way down here at Mount Sinai. And we know that there are Midianite towns and encampments all the way up the coast of the Reed Sea up to Etzion Gever, where you hit Edom land. So that's way down south. And remember, it was an 11 days journey from Mount Sinai to Kadesh. So you have all this Midianite people. Then you have all the Edom people. Sorry. Then you have all the Moabite people. And then you have way up north the Amorites, which are more powerful than the Moabites because they take Moabite land in our story today. So these are the five. Those are four. Oh, they've already beat Amalek. They've already dealt with Amalek, at least on some level. So they had to beat Amalek. They have to beat Edom, they, or deal with Edom. They have to deal with Moab. They have to deal with the Amorites, these giant kings, Sihon and Og, which own hundreds of cities. And they have to deal with the Midianites. And this is not a small thing, which I'll show you. So they got, they got a long way to go. Long way to go. I went the wrong way. All right. So then they leave Mount Hor. And they go in, they, they win Arad and the cities around it. And then, immediately after that, God tells them the same thing he told them when they went in the first time and got beat. They went in by the way of the tourists, and they came back with a Lashon Hara, a bad word, an evil word, evil speech, against the land of Israel. God swore they would never enter the kingdom. And immediately, it says in number, Numbers, we read it last week, that God says, turn and go south by way of the Reed Sea. And they had to repeat the same exact exercise. Why? Because when we are told, or when we learn, or when we're instructed to do something, doesn't matter what it is in our life, and we don't do it, or we do it wrong, or we don't learn from it, Guess what we have to do? We have to repeat the exercise. And I told you last week, that's why my dad used to always say, what is the purpose of this exercise? In other words, we're going to have to do it again. The purpose of the exercise was to learn something. Israel didn't learn anything. And so they had to repeat the exercise, and they head south. Now, it, he it says they head south around the land of Edom. So they're here at Kadesh. On the edge of Edomite territory, they've gone to Mount Hor, remember. They leave Mount Hor, and now they're going to go south. But immediately, problem starts. And the geniuses of Israel, whoops, went the wrong way. The geniuses of Israel start complaining. They start complaining about 
everything about Moses, about God. And so God sends snakes to bite them. And if they, and, and then, and then, you know, a bunch of them died. And Moses was told, you know, Moses said, what, what do we do? What do we do, God? Moses was told, make a big pole and put a nachushtan, which is a bronze or fiery serpent on the pole, which means it was made, they had to construct this big giant serpent on the pole. It's not a little thing. It's a huge thing. And it was erected and set up. And it says in John 3.14, just, it says, you must be born again. It's in that passage of you must be born again. And it says, just like Moshe set up the Nachash, Nachushtan, on the pole in the wilderness, so will the Son of Man be lifted up, and anybody who looks at him will be saved. Just like what happened here. This is not a good thing. This is a bad thing. It's a curse. So, God heals them if they look at the snake on the pole. Now, this happened here in the wilderness. They don't get very far. They start moving south, and as soon as they start moving south, it all goes bad. Sorry. It all goes bad, and they immediately have to turn north. So it's not like they went wandering in the wilderness for a long time. They just started moving out, they blew it, and they had to immediately turn north. Now that passage in, uh, in Numbers 21, 4 through 9, it describes right after they leave Mount Hor, they did this. Uh, and, and you can tell in the way it's written, sometimes you can't tell, but you can tell in the way it's written that it's, it's fairly immediate. Verse 3, the Lord heard the voice of Israel and delivered up the Canaanites, then they utterly destroyed them in their cities. This is talking about Hormah. They beat Arad and the Amalekites. Very next verse, they set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Reed Sea to go, in order to go around the land of Edom, and the people immediately become impatient because of the journey. They haven't even journeyed, and they're already complaining. And the people spoke against God and Moshe, why have you brought us up out of Egypt? They're talking about 38 years ago um, to die in the wilderness. There's no food, there's no water. In other words, why did we leave Kadesh? We were there, we were fine. So they complain the whole time and they're, they're, they're in Kadesh that they got nothing to eat, there's no water. And God provides for them for 38 years in Kadesh. The second they leave Kadesh, they start complaining again. Verse 6, and the Lord sent fiery serpents, and then they set up the, uh, the bronze, the Nehushtan on the pole. All right, now in verse 10, after this event, it says, the, the sons of Israel moved out and camped in Ovot. Now the reason I say they went north is because Ovot is north. Punon, which they went to, is also north of, you know, Mount, it's even north of Mount Hor. But it says they went south to the, by the way of the Reed Sea. So we know they went down, they had to come right back up. All right. The sons of Israel moved out and camped in the vote. Then they camped in Ie Avarim, the ruins of Avarim. Now they're at Wadi Zered. This is a beautiful place, by the way, Wadi Zered. Uh, I thought it was like just a small wadi. No, it's beautiful ravines, um, high cliffs. It's beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. Um, so they go to uh, uh, Ie Avarim in the wilderness, which is opposite Moab. So now they got another big problem to deal with, Moab. They're right on the edge of the border of Moab to the east. From there, they set out and camped in Wadi Zared. Now, Wadi Zared is a pretty long water course. It's a few miles long. Don't know where they camped in Wadi Zared. A million people in that Wadi. 
Think about that. So it had to be big enough to, to support everybody. And maybe the caravan stretched from here to here. I don't know. But uh, they're camping in Wadi Zered. From there they journeyed and camped on the other side of the Arnon. Now this is strange. Because Arnon is the other border of Moab. Way up here. Sorry, way up here. Now at this time... Moab land goes all the way up to Amorite land, and they kiss. Moab is kind of scared of the Amorites, because the Amorites are more powerful than Moabites. And in fact, very shortly, Amorite is going to come in and swarm into Moab and, and take half their land. They're going to take all that northern part of their land. But Arnon, which Later on, and very shortly, is going to be the border, the northern border of Moab. And Wadi Zered, which is the southern border of Moab, Israel, in one verse, Israel just goes right up here. Doesn't say how, doesn't say where, doesn't, it does give you the camps in Numbers 33, but it just says they go here to the north part of Moab. That means they pass through Moab land. They didn't go around. They went right up to the top of Moab land. I think this is going to cause problems because they're going through somebody else's land. It's not a small thing with a million people. It would be like if Russians had a million people and they said, can we go, like, you know, just follow the, the Mississippi River from New Orleans, we just want to go from New Orleans up to, to Chicago. Can we do that? I, I don't think so. <laughs> not with a million people. So this is not a small thing. So they set out, they camped at Wadi Zered, and they journeyed, and they camped on the other side of Arnon, which is in the wilderness that comes out of the border of the Amorites. For the Arnon is the border of Moab, between Moab and the Amorites. Amorites are giants. They're all giants. Moab, there's a couple giants. But Amorites are huge. These are monsters. These are the ones that really scared the Amalekites, and, and these guys were the ones that really scared the spies. Sorry, the tourists, the apostles. And then it goes into this whole thing about the war between Amorites and Moabites. And it's all written in riddles and songs and stuff like that. So this is where this is where um, Moab is dealt with. And it's not pretty. Twenty one twenty one. Then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites. Now there are two giant kings. It even tells you know Og his bed was nine, nine and a half feet long, because he was nine and he was probably nine feet tall. And the Amorites are all here, and all here. You see what happened? The whole top half of Moab got chopped down. Well, it got chopped down by the Amorites. The Amorites have swarmed in while Israel is moving north through Moab, and they took all this Moabite land. Verse 21, then Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, saying, let me pass through your land. We will not turn off into the field. So now Israel is saying, you know, they're up, they're up here, and they're saying, let us pass through your land. I guess they want to go up here to Israel, I guess. What do they want to pass through Amorite land for? They're right here on the Arnon. I, I don't know what they want. I guess, I guess they want to go in here, I guess. I don't know. So, oh, I, I, I skipped something. Back in verse 20, it says that they went from the Arnon, uh, 1920, up here to Mount Nebo. So they traveled north to Mount Nebo. I left that out. Please forgive me. Now they're up here. So they're right at the top of the Salt Sea, up here. And this is where all the last troubles of Israel take place. This is where 
Bilam comes. This is where the matter of Peor takes place. This is where our Torah portion today takes place with Pinchas. Up here, way up north, at Mount Nebo. So, where, where, where do they want to go from Mount Nebo? I guess they want to go into Israel. I guess. And they're saying, let us pass through here to go to Israel. Again, I guess. I, I'm, I'm not sure. But uh, nevertheless, that's what they want. And the Amorites say, no, you shall not pass. Same thing that the Edomites did. And um, so they go to war. They go to war with these giants, the Amorites. Verse 21, Israel sent messengers to Sihon, let me pass through your field. Sihon, verse 23, says, you shall not pass. Verse 24, oh, sorry, end of verse 23. So the Amorites go down to Yahaz, and they say, meet us in battle, Israel. So Israel comes, they jump down here from Mount Nebo down to Yahaz, and they go to war. See those purple lines? Those purple lines mean Israel won, just like they did with the Amalekites. Down here at Yahaz, they beat the Amorites at Yahaz, which is just crazy. And when they beat the Amorites, guess what they do? They turn and they destroy Moab cities. They go down here, all the way down to here to, to, to the Arnon River, and they just wipe out all the Moabite cities that were there. They swing around, destroy all the Moabite cities there, with, and Amorite cities. Then they go way up here, all the way to the Yavok River. This Yavok River to the Arnon was the established boundary of the Amorites. So now they've taken all the Amorite land and all the Moabite land, and they're still not in Israel. Sounds fantastic, right? Ready for the kingdom, we're ready to go in. No, they still got problems. They still got some problems to face, unfortunately. But they take all this land, just like they took the Amalekite land, in the land of Israel. And by the way, this is in the land of Israel. This is on the other side of the Jordan. This is the land of Reuben, Gad, and Manasseh. That's, that's who got that land. So they destroyed all the Amorite cities from the Arnon all the way up to the Yavok. Sounds fantastic. Sounds like they are ready for the kingdom. We'll see. Next thing, number five. <laughs> so, Israel then is sent, Moshe says, I want you to go, the way it's translated is spy. Spy on Yazer. It's not spy, it's walk. Go walk, regle. Go walk uh, Yazer, which is one of the big capital cities of the Amorites. And so, the Amorites attack Israel again at Yazer, and they take it. They take it. And now there's another king. We had Sihon, and now we have Og. Sihon was beat, and now Og tries. Og is another huge giant uh, of, of the Amorites, and he's going to try to destroy Israel. So look how far up this is. Edre. That's up in northern Israel. I mean, that's, that's way up north. I mean, that, I, I can't even get all of this on the map. Look how far up it is. From, they've gone from Mount Sinai all the way up to Kadesh. They went from Kadesh to uh, the Arnon River. Sorry, to Wadi Zered. Then they went up to the Arnon River. They're going to go all the way up here to Edre way up north. So this is a lot of land that they're taking. And as I said, this is land that is going to be on the east side of the Jordan for Israel. Edre, way up here. It's one of the borders of Israel. And they go up here to Edre and they win. And they 
Then they spread out and they destroy 60 cities of the Amorites, which is just crazy. 60 cities. Deuteronomy 3, 4 says, And we captured all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we did not take from them. 60 cities, all the region of Argov, the kingdom of Og in Bashan. These were all cities. They were fortified with high walls, gates, and bars. So don't think, you know, uh, what are they called? Bedouins, Bedouin tents. These are fortified castles. Picture Braveheart. Picture Scottish castles, if you, you know, if that helps you. These are fortified cities with high walls, and they took 60 of them. Pretty amazing, pretty amazing. You'd think, all right, we won, we won, we won, we won, we won, we won 60 times, plus God only knows how many times down here with the Amorites and the Moabites. God only knows how many battles they won, how many cities they took. And so, I mean, in my mind, maybe I'm, maybe it's wishful thinking, but I would think, okay, we're ready to enter the kingdom. And besides, it says 60 cities. What do you think that's a picture of? 6,000 years of fortified enemy winning. 6,000 years. They're still not ready. They're still not ready to enter the kingdom. Because our little friend from the Euphrates, the sorcerer of God, Belam, now rises up. And he is hired by Moab. Now the reason I have the big map here is to show you how far down Midian is. Because I don't know how this worked. I really don't. But um, the Euphrates is about 100 miles north of here. This is where the Jews are now. They're right here at the north end of the, of the Dead Sea, the Salt Sea, right here. About 100 miles north is the Euphrates River. And that's where this sorcerer of God, the, the what do they call Warlock. The Warlock of Christ. That's where he lives. And he comes down a hundred miles and he's hired by Moab. He's not hired by the Amorites who just got beat. He's not hired by the Edomites. He's not hired by the Midianites. He's hired by Moabites because they're terrified. So he comes all the way down and the way he defeats Israel, because he does, one guy defeats Israel, by hiring hookers from Midian all the way down here. And there is an enormous million-man army at the end of, uh, it's actually next week's Torah portion, which we'll talk about next week. A million-man army that Israel beats and they're Midianites because of this one sorcerer. One sorcerer. And he hired women from Midian to come up and defeat Israel. Now before he did that, you know, he, you probably know the story that, that he is called to curse Israel. And all he's going to do is mumble some words. What's the big deal? And, and by the way, we're talking about big money here. We're talking about a couple million dollars. Would you pay a couple million dollars to have somebody mumble some words for you? Because that's what they're doing. Back then, people believed in words. You know, people don't believe in words anymore. <clears throat> in the scriptures, I'll give you an example. <clears throat> when Jacob and Esau go to their father Isaac for the blessing. For the blessing. Ah, blessing is just words. That's all it is. And Jacob, you know, through trickery, gets there first. He poses like Esau, like his brother Edom. And he gets there first. And Isaac blesses 
Jacob with words. He says, may you have the fatness of the earth and the, and the, the oil or the, the fatness, the richness of the, the moon and the sun and the fields and, and all this. All he does is mumble some words. Esau comes running in. I missed it. I missed it. What about me? Is there a blessing for me too? And his father says, nope, sorry, I already gave it to your brother. And he wants to kill his brother over this. Just because he mumbled some words. He has no ability to make these words happen. He doesn't say, may you be given, you know, two-thirds of my fields, like the, the, like the inheritance. He says, may you be given the earth and the moon and the sun and the this and that. He gives all these big, giant concepts. And he's willing to kill his brother. Esau is willing to kill his brother Jacob over some words. That are, because they were true, and they were from God, and they were going to happen. And they all knew it. Even Esau, who was a you know, Satan-worshipping idiot, even he knew it. So, this guy, Bilaam, was like that. He, it says in the Talmud, you can believe this or not believe it, it says that he was a greater prophet than Moses. And had he accepted the Torah, immediately he would have spoken and all of Israel would have not needed Moses. Because we would have all had the Torah, we would have had the Spirit of God, we'd have known all things in the Torah, and we'd have had a perfect knowledge of God because of this guy. That he was a greater prophet. In other words, he had the ability to see clearer than Moses. I don't know if I believe that or not. It might be true. Um, I'll just have to do more research. But I know this. He, he is a powerful, powerful prophet. So he said a few things that I want to look at that are in Numbers 23 and 24. In 23, I'm just going to like skitter across the surface here. <clears throat> he tries three times to curse Israel and he ends up blessing them. And in the in the midst of these blessings, uh, 23, 9 says this, I see him from the top of the rocks, and I look at him from the hills. Behold, a people who dwells apart. Um, many Christians who are well-meaning still have anti-Semitism in their heart. They just don't know it. When somebody like me, <clears throat> a big mouth Jew who knows God, is standing across from them, it becomes very apparent that they're anti that they have anti-Semitism in their heart. Doesn't mean they're anti-Semitic. It just means that there is that ways of their fathers that is still hanging on, and it's in their heart. God said about Jacob about Israel. There are people who dwells apart. They are not counted with the Gentiles. Behold, a people who dwells apart, they shall not be counted among the nations, among the Gentiles. Do you know what that means? That means we're different. If you have a problem with believing that the Jews are God's chosen people, chosen people, then you have anti-Semitism in your heart. Um, and where it came from is where it came from. I don't know, and it's none of my business. That's your business. But it is also your business to understand that God does not look at us, the Jewish people, the way he looks at Gentiles. He does not look at all people the same way. He doesn't. Um, if you believe that, then you're wrong and you've been told something that isn't true. The truth is that God looks at Israel different. I'm going to show you another verse that, that shows this. That he looks at that um, he looks at Israel differently from the Gentiles. Why? Because to us was given all the pictures of what's in heaven. And it really is the only thing that was ever given by God so that we can come to know him. We didn't ask for it. We didn't do anything good with it. <laughs> Not much, anyway. We blew it, but we were given it. 
And because we were given that culture, God looks at us differently. When he looks down at the Jews, he doesn't number us or see us with the Gentiles. We're a people apart from the Gentiles. You know who understands this better than anybody? The Nazis. They had more, they had more understanding of this because of their demonic anointing, if you will, uh, than most Christians do. Christians don't, for the most part, understand this concept that we are not like the Gentiles. We're not. Because we were given something that the Gentiles were not. 23.21 is the other verse I want to show you that ties in with this or helps to explain it. He has. This is a weird verse. He has not seen sin, is what it says. It does not say misfortune. It says sin, avon, in Jacob. Nor has he seen trouble in Israel. Really? Really? He has not seen sin or trouble in Israel? That's right. Um, I'll put it in terms you can understand. If you're born again, if you're a Christian and you're born again, and God looks down at you, this is you, this is the covering of the blood of Messiah over you. He looks down at you. He doesn't see you. He sees that blood. Now, for the Jewish people who do not have that blood covering, before God sent the Messiah, we already had a covering that covered us, that kept from God seeing our sin. It is not the sacrifices. That's not what it is. It was chen, grace. The grace of God in giving us the pictures of heaven was our covering. Because the blood of Messiah is what all those pictures pointed to. And if you don't think that Jews knew God, you're wrong. It says, no da bihuda Elohim. God is known in Judah. That's in Psalm 74, verse 1. In Judah, God's name is, in Israel, God's name is great. God is known in the Jews, in Judaism. In Israel, God's name is great. So God looks down at Israel, just, just completely immersed in sin. Remember, Kadesh was called Kadesh because of the male cult prostitutes in the tabernacle of God. And they also had the tabernacle of Molech, and they had the tabernacle of Saturn, Kiyun. And they were doing this along with worshiping Yehovah. And God looks down and doesn't see it. He sees no sin in Jacob. Now, if that verse bothers you, it bothers you because you don't understand that God set Israel apart as different. And why did he do it? So we could teach the world about God. All right. Chapter 24. Another weird thing that, that uh, the wizard of Christ said. 24.5, and I'm calling them that on purpose for a reason. 24.5, I was reading some Christian commentaries about Bilaam, and two of, them, two of them said, no doubt, I, they were probably quoting each other, but I, I can't prove it. No doubt, Bilaam knew Christ. That's what it said, literally said that. You know, 2,400 years before Yeshua, no doubt, Bilaam knew Christ. So, in other words, he, he knew God, but he was a demonic sorcerer. The warlock of Christ. 2417 is a confusing guy. 2417, this is really important. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob. And a scepter, that means like a, a ruling, a, a staff of the ruler. And a scepter shall rise from Israel and shall crush through the forehead of Moab. And this he's saying in front of the people, Moabites, who hired him to bless Moab and curse Israel. <laughs> he probably wanted to kill him and tear down all the sons of Shep. This is a prophecy of the coming Messiah. I see him, but not now, not near. I see him off in the distance. He's coming from Jacob. He's a scepter. He's a ruler 
from, from Israel. And he's going to destroy Moab and Edom and Amalek. This is talking about the Messiah. So, these are important things that, uh, that the, the warlock uh, uh, Bilaam said. All right, let's go to Numbers 31. And this is the end of the story. Now, because these curses, you know, the, the, all the money, the $2 million that they paid Bilaam didn't work. And by the way, he got to keep the money. All this money that they gave Bilaam that didn't work. Uh, Bilaam, you know, I guess he feels bad because he, <laughs> he, he got all that money for nothing. I guess he felt bad. So he comes up with another plan. And he says, this is what we'll do. We're going to hire these women from down here in Midian. And we'll have them have orgies and worship their gods, the gods of Midian. The gods of Midian down by Mount Sinai. What does that mean? So, Numbers 31, 16. Uh, this is later on. At the, actually, it's in next week's Torah portion. <clears throat> Verse 15. Moses said to them, Have you spared all the women? Behold, these women caused the sons of Israel, through the counsel of Bilam, to trespass against the Lord in the matter of Peor. So the plague was among the congregation of the Lord. The matter of Peor means that area. Whoops, sorry that area up here at Mount Peor. That's where they are. They're right on the border of Israel, ready to go in. And they blow it huge. And so, it also says in Revelation chapter 2, uh, talking to believers in the day of the Lord, he says, you have some people that hold to the doctrine, the doctrine of Balaam, who counseled Moab to have Midianite women have sexual immorality with Israel and eat things sacrificed to idols. So they would invite them to these huge parties and have sex with them. And thus they got God jealous. Which brings us to the Torah portion this week. Now, I told you that the name of the Torah portion is how to feel what God feels. How to feel what God feels. Now because Israel worshipped these demons at Baal Peor. Um, let's read that. 25, 1 through 3. And because they did this, this is why Pinchas, not Phineas, this is why Pinchas rose up to do what he did. By the way, he is the grandson of the high priest, Pinchas. He's in line to be the high priest. 25. While Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to play the whore with the daughters of Moab. Now it calls them the daughters of Moab. I thought it was Midianite women. Isn't that strange? So what happened here, remember this was Midianite land. They're right here, ready to enter in. They had asked uh, the Ammonites, can we come through your land? Ammon said, no, we're going to kill you. They, in other words, they, so they destroyed the Ammon, Amorites. And so they're left here with the Moabites, who they also uh, wiped out, a bunch of cities of. And now, Moab links with Midian. They're worshipping the same gods, I suppose, Chemosh and Baal and Molech, and so there's Midianite women and Moabite women. This is not a small thing. I don't know how many there were until next week's Torah portion. There were thousands. Thousands. So some are Midianite, some are Moabite. And it says they played the whore with the daughters of Moab, for they invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal Peor, and the Lord was angry against Israel. Down to verse 7. Now we're at the Torah portion. All that was just to enter into the Torah portion. Pinchas ben Eleazar ben Aharon the priest saw it, and he rose from the midst of the congregation, 
and took his spear in hand. Well, let me tell you what he saw. Verse 6. One of the sons of Israel, from uh, Simeon, came and brought to the brothers a Midianite woman. He brought to the Jews a Midianite, Midianite woman, not Moabite, Midianite woman in the sight of, of Moshe and in the sight of the congregation of the sons of Israel while they were weeping at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Pin, this is what Pinchas saw. While they're hawking and spitting and praying and trying to get God to forgive them because a plague has broken out, this guy gets a Midianite woman and prances right up to him with her and says, hey, you want to come worship her God? He's got a really good orgy going on, man. Really good orgy. Come on, man. And so Pinchas loses it. Only he doesn't lose it. He's in complete and total control. But if you look at it on the surface, he loses it. Verse 8, he went to the man of Israel into the tent and he pierced both of them through the man of Israel and the woman through the body. So God stopped the plague. 24,000 people were killed because of it. All right. See how they're not ready for the kingdom? Now this is where I'm going to say stuff that you're not going to like. You're not going to like it. So you just just get get over it. Get over it. If you don't if you don't know me, it's easy not to trust me. If you've been listening to me for any length of time, you need you you should trust me by now. You know I know what I'm talking about. You know everything I'm saying. I check thoroughly in the scripture against hundreds of scriptures. I don't believe anything that I can't prove. Or else I just don't believe it. I just don't. So you need, you need to believe what I'm saying so that you go check it. Don't just listen to my words with your ears and then just blow me off. Listen to my words with your heart and then go check me in the scriptures. Last week, I talked about, is the body of Messiah ready to enter the kingdom? We are not. We are not ready. All of our words are wrong about the day of the Lord. All of our beliefs are wrong about the day of the Lord. All of the things that we teach about the day of the Lord are wrong because we don't know the vocabulary. It's that simple. We haven't learned the vocabulary. And so, because we don't know what Judaism teaches about each festival, we cannot picture in our minds what is going to happen on that festival in the day of the Lord, which is our hope, not the coming of Christ. We're not waiting for the coming of Christ. You should never, ever say that phrase again as long as you live. We're waiting for the Messianic kingdom. We're waiting for the day of the Lord. We're waiting for God's Shabbat, Sabbath. Now you can say that, but you cannot say we're waiting for the coming of Jesus. And I explained this thoroughly last week. We are just like the Jews who were supposed to go into, not a land, into a day, the kingdom, pictured by the land, and they weren't ready. They weren't ready for two reasons, because they were full of sin, because that generation wasn't completely dead yet, and because it wasn't time. You're supposed to know the time. Remember, they could count the days of when they were going to go into the land. God had said, 40 years. You're not going in for 40 years. So what did they do? They tried to go in and... You know, and a rod came down and they won. Big deal. It wasn't time. They wanted to pass through Ammonite land and go into the land, I guess. And they end up in two giant, at three giant battles, which they win, but it's still not time. It's not time. You're supposed to know when the kingdom is coming. And you're most probably not ready just like Israel wasn't ready. That's why this happened. 
It happened because they weren't ready. They weren't thinking, oh, we get to go into the, into the kingdom. They weren't looking for the kingdom. They were just kind of obsessed with the land, the physical land. The here and now, life now. Yeshua said, quit worrying about what you're going to wear. Quit worrying about what you're going to eat. Quit worrying about what you're going to drink. Life is not about food and drink and clothing. Seek first the coming of Christ. Seek first the kingdom, the day of the Lord. So, I say we're still we are right in the same boat as these people were. They were not ready to enter the kingdom. So this guy, Pinchas, rises up, and this is what he does. He, he shish kebabs a Jew and a Gentile Midianite woman together, just shish kebabs them, runs a spear through both of them while they're having sex during the orgy. And there's no nice way to say this. So, because he did that, you know, I'm left. Believe me, Jews read this and are like, "This is our God. This kind of brutality and cruelty and bloodiness. Oh, it's disgusting. What kind of justice is that? What is justice? Because he felt what God felt. If you want to feel what God, well, maybe you don't. Maybe you. Uh, maybe I'm assuming too much." that I'm assuming that you want to know God. That's what I'm assuming. Well, if you're going to know God, you need to know what he feels when he feels it, right? I mean, does that, does that, isn't that logical? That if you're going to know somebody, you need to know what they feel when they feel it, or else you don't know them, not really. You may know them in a cursory manner, but you don't know them with any depth. So, this guy knew God. Because I'm going to show you that he felt God's feelings. Verse 11. I'll read it in English first. Pinchas ben Eleazar ben Aharon Hakohen has I said English has turned away my wrath from the sons of Israel. In that this is how he did it. He turned away my wrath in that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I didn't destroy the sons of Israel in my jealousy. He did that because he felt what I felt. Now, what it says in Hebrew is this. Pinchas ben Eleazar ben Aharon HaKohen turned my wrath from, from on Israel. Al Israel. Like my wrath coming down on Israel in Bekano. His jealousy. His jealousy. Not God's jealousy. Pinchas's jealousy. Bacano, in his jealousy, so that my jealousy inside them. That's what it says. He turned my wrath from Israel in his jealousy, that my jealousy, et kinati, inside them, betochem. That's all it says. So I did not consume them, bekinati, in my jealousy. It says the word jealous three times. Once is Pinchas's and twice is God's. In other words, Pinchas felt what God felt. God was jealous. And nobody was feeling it. Everybody was like, oh, God, please make the plague stop. Oh, God. Instead of, stop what you're doing. Even to the point of bloodshed. Because that's what God felt. He felt that jealousy. Of a of, a, of a, a cuckold is what it's called in 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 Greek tragedy a cuckold um, a guy who has his wife is having sex with another man and that's what's happening Israel God's bride is having sex with another demon another man and God's jealous and so Eleazar I'm sorry Pinchas feels that he goes after the guys with a with a spear and he shish kebabs them but I don't want you to miss this. He turned my wrath from on Israel in his jealousy. He had the jealousy. 
that my jealousy, et kinati, inside them. It's weird in Hebrew. It doesn't really translate well in English, so I'll tell you what it means. Betochem, betochem is the same word that's used when God says to build the tabernacle. He says, Ve'asu li mikdash v'shachanti betocham. Let them build a mishkan that I may dwell inside of them. That's the purpose of the tabernacle. So God could dwell inside of Israel. God is known in Judah. In Israel, God's name is great. Because he gave us that culture based on the tabernacle and the temple. What's supposed to be inside them, according to God? It kinati betochem. My jealousy inside them. In other words, they ain't got my jealousy. But that guy does. I'm going to bless that guy. Because he felt what I felt. What Israel should have felt. They should have felt my jealousy. But they didn't. They don't feel anything. In my opinion, this is exactly like the body of Messiah. And they end up singing songs like, The zeal of God has come to me. <laughs> no, it hasn't. There's no such thing as zeal. It's the word jealousy. Has it consumed you? So that you hate the idolatry in the church? I don't think it has, because it's still there. <laughs> I don't see anybody railing against it. And by the way, you Hebrew Christians who rail against it, you're mean. You're not very nice. You're, you're nasty. Why, why not be nice about it, like me? Why not do it with a smile on your face? But no, it's never a smile. It's, you need to keep the law of God. No, they do not. They need to keep the law of God. Because it's not law. It's mitzvah. It's set up, established thing. It's Torah, instruction. It's not law. And so they don't know. They're like, oh, we don't want to do the law. Well, good, don't do the law. Do the Torah, do the instruction. And make war on your own idolatry. Let's get it out of the body of Messiah, like Pinchas did. Run it through with a spear. Gentiles hate the way I talk. And I'm talking about Gentiles who are studying Judaism. Ones who, you know, are, they're on the right trajectory. They're studying Judaism, they're trying to learn, you know, the right things, and they love to hear me talk and learn from me. But when I start talking like a Jew, they hate it. They hate, and I get it, I really do. Problem is, that's how God is. When I start talking like this, it's because I hear and I feel God saying and feeling. I can feel it, I can see it, I can hear it. And I know what he's saying. And you can't say these things couched in nice little phrases because then they end up getting all, you know, uh, flattened out. And then you're right back where you started with Hellenism, where we present everything in a beautiful way and we make nice and we say it in a kind and generous way so that no one's offended. And we're right back where we started. Better thing to do is feel what God feels. And I'm talking to you. I already feel it. Better thing to do is for you to feel what God feels and get over it. And if, you know, I, I understand it's hard to hear this from a Jew. You think it'd be easier from a Gentile? Maybe it would. I don't know. But I know this is my place. And I know this is what I'm supposed to do. <coughs> Not only that, I know this is how I'm supposed to say it. And I know this. It's not something I believe in my head. It's something I know. I know what my ministry is. I know what I am as an apostle. I know what I'm doing. <clears throat> Just because you don't like it doesn't mean I'm not doing the right thing. It means it bothers you. It bothers your heart. So try to hear me. Try something else. What you're doing doesn't work. You still feel the same way you felt before when you were doing Christianity. You still feel the same way. You still don't quite know. So, 
make war on the idolatry in you. It's in you. It's in me too. Don't get me wrong. It's in me too. And it's my job to make war on it in me. Well, it's your job to make war on, on it in you. Now, in Exodus 20, verse 5, God says this. He says, I, Yehovah, am el Kinah. That means the God who is jealous, or God jealous. I, Yehovah, am a, they translate as a jealous God. I don't think that's right. He's saying his name, el Kinah, God of jealous. God the jealous. Because, he says in Exodus 34, 14, I, Yehovah, whose name is Kinah, am El Kinah. I, Yehovah, whose name is Jealous, that's his name, am God the Jealous. If you don't think God's jealous, you're wrong. Deuteronomy 5, 9. I, same thing. I, Yehovah, your God, am El Kinah, the God Jealous. God the Jealous. I am God the Jealous. That's what he's saying. Now remember, there's no such word as zeal. It doesn't exist in the Bible. It's jealous. Go back and read all those passages. All you got to do is look it up in the concordance online. Just go to Strong's Concordance, type in zeal, and every one of them, almost every one of them, there's a couple that are different words that are not zeal. Uh, there, there's a Persian word, which means to measure accurately. But they're all, they're all kina. They're all kina. In my jealousy I shall save Zion. In my jealousy I shall raise up Israel in the day of the Lord. In my jealousy Israel shall go out and wipe out the nations. In my jealousy I shall rise up in wrath in the day of the Lord. All kinds of verses like that. So you need to go back and <coughs> retool your thinking to stop saying zeal and stop singing that song because the zeal of God doesn't burn up anybody in the church from what I've seen. You guys don't even know what zeal is. Zeal is jealousy for God. It's jealousy for the Torah. It's jealousy for the Torah and the Spirit together. Where's that? <clears throat> I'll tell you what I mean. In Acts, oh, Messianic Jews love to quote this verse. Can you not see that there are thousands who know, who believe in the Messiah, and they are all zealous for the Torah? It's not zealous, it's jealous. They're all jealous for the Torah. They've got that jealousy. How dare you? How dare you touch my bride? How dare you? have sex with other gods. Paganism, Hellenism. It's like that. All right. So how is it, how is it that Pinchas was able to feel what God feels? And this is the question I've asked many believers. They always answer the same way. They say something, and I'll, I'll post this question to you. How is it possible for us to feel what God feels? You probably had something, a sentence come to your mind with the word Holy Spirit in it. Um, that ain't good enough. Because you're making the Holy Spirit about feelings. And the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with feelings. The Holy Spirit has to do with the Torah. And once you do the Torah, then there might be some feelings. That's how Pinchas felt what God felt. He did the Torah. There's another guy who did the Torah before the Torah was really established. In fact, 430 years before the Torah was given, Abraham. Abraham was jealous for the Torah. It says he did the mitzvot. He did the chokim. Mitzvot is, is uh, established things. He did the chokim, which is translated as statutes. He did the mishmarim, the watches, or the, the listenings, and he did the Torah, the instruction, Torah. 
And remember, it was Nachmanides, Ramban, who said, uh, summing up all of what, what the, ra the, sa the sages and rabbis said, according to the opinion of the sages, it appears to me that Abraham did the Torah by the Holy Spirit. That's how Pinchas did it. You can't just say, well, he's just filled by the Holy Spirit. He did the Torah. That's how he felt by the Holy Spirit. Are you doing the Torah? If you're not doing the Torah and listening to it preach to you about Messiah, the Holy Spirit ain't talking to you. I'm sorry. He might, you might think she is. The Holy Spirit's a, fe a female, a feminine side of God. You might think that the Holy Spirit's talking to you, but I seriously doubt he is or she is. Because many of the things that you think you heard by the Holy Spirit, maybe it was. But then why do some of them go against the Torah? The Torah and the Spirit are one. All right, so here's how he did it. I said, you probably thought immediately something about the Holy Spirit. Well, that's how, that's how Abraham did the Torah, and that's the key. That's how Abraham did the Torah. He was taught it by the Holy Spirit. John 3, verse 8. The wind blows where it wants to, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. You don't know where it's coming or where it's going. It's just sort of like the wind blowing to and fro, here and there, in a haphazard manner, which makes no sense, really. But you feel it. You feel the beautiful, delicious wind against thy skins. It's not what it's saying. Now, I know that Christians think like this. I don't think they do. I know they do. And the reason I do is because, sorry, I was asked to illustrate a book uh, years ago by a Christian really highly regarded Christian pastor and teacher and book writer. And when he came to, I'm not going to say what his name is, I don't want to do the Shon Hara. When he came to this portion in John 3, 8, I was supposed to illustrate that. Now I already had an understanding of what Yeshua was quoting, but they wouldn't accept what I wanted to illustrate. They wanted me to illustrate his writing about it. And his writing about it said, it's the Holy Spirit is, is kind of gossamer and hard to put your fingers on, and it just blows where it listeth, is what it says in King James, which means just kind of haphazard wherever. And I did a picture of a tree with wind blowing through it. That's about it. Because I couldn't do any more than that because they wouldn't accept it or else they wouldn't accept the illustration. So if you're going to know what the New Testament says, you must know what's being quoted in the Tanakh or else you have no clue. Hear me Christians, you have no clue what is being said. You are being confounded by the words of the New Testament. Because you don't know where it's coming from. Kind of like this. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't know what it's quoting in the Tanakh. And here's what it's quoting in the Tanakh. Blowing toward the south, then turning toward the north, the wind continues swirling along on its circular courses, the wind returns to Shuv. Now the word for spirit is ruach. It is also the same word for wind. So when Yeshua says the spirit, you must be born of the spirit. Everybody who's born of the ruach is like the ruach, the wind. But I don't think it's a good translation. You don't know where it comes from. I think it's closer to say you can't see it but you know it's going in a swirling, circular pattern. You can't see it, you can't grasp it, but you know the pattern. And here's the problem. 
the difference between Christianity, Hellenized Christianity, and God's body, which I will call Judaism, because it's a Jewish body. It's not a Hebrew body. It's not Hebrew roots. It's Jewish roots. Yehudot, Judaism. There's nothing in the scriptures that says the way of the Hebrews. God is known in Hebrew. God is known in the Hebrews. It says God is known in Judah. In Israel, God's name is great. The difference between Judaism and Christianity is this. Which way is the spirit going? In Judaism, in Yehudot, we know which way the wind is going. In Christianity, it's haphazard. For the most part, because of Hellenism, it's haphazard. You don't know where it listed. You don't know where it's going. You don't know where it's coming from, and you don't know where it's going. But the ride sure is enjoyable. It's not what it's saying. I live up on a hill and there's very few wind breaks around my house. So I know which way the wind is going during the cycle of the year. I know that in north, sorry, uh, in winter, the wind blows from the north. I know this. I see it every year. There is the wind coming from the north. I know that in spring, after winter, it's coming from the west. It happens every, almost every day in spring. I know that when summer comes, the wind blows up from the south. I experience this every year. I know that when fall comes around after summer, then it's an east wind. The wind blows in from the east. I experience this every year. Look at the direction of that cycle. It's counterclockwise. This is the direction of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not go clockwise. The Holy Spirit goes counterclockwise. The Holy Spirit goes, I actually, let's start in uh, spring. Spring, summer, fall, winter. West, south, east, north. Blowing toward the south. And then turning toward the north. The wind continues swirling, and it is a swirling in Hebrew, which means circular, along on its circular courses. In case you didn't get it with the first word, it repeats twice. It swirls along on its circular courses. So it is definitely going counterclockwise, and it's definitely going in a cycle, in a circle. This is how Pinchas knew what God felt. Judaism. You can know. And by the way, if this doesn't happen for you, blame it on me. If you listen to me, and you do what I say, and it doesn't happen, blame it on me. But it will happen, if you do it. If you start following the cycle of God, year after year after year, you'll feel what God feels. You'll know when God is sad. You'll know when God is happy. You'll know when God is giddy. You'll know when God is tickled. You'll know when God is so angry that you just want to spit. You'll know. So let's start talking about that cycle. Remember, those who are born of the Spirit follow the wind. Those who are born of the Spirit follow the wind. The wind goes in a circular cycle. Spring is the cycle, or tekufa. Now these are, this is what we call seasons, but in Hebrew it's tekufa. And remember we're going this way. The tekufa of Nisan is the spring. And then comes summer, which is the tekufa of Tammuz. And then we have fall with, from Tishri to Kislev, which is the tekufa of Tishri. Tishri is the big month, the month where the seventh month where all the big festivals are. 
Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, Sukkot, Shemini, etc. And then the winter is the Tekufa of Tibet. Four what we call seasons, but they're actually four quadrants of this circle. Now, if you're not following the cycle of the Holy Spirit, the cycle of the Torah, you're not following the Spirit. You're simply not. Because the Holy Spirit gave us this. Not some clever Jews. The Holy Spirit designed this. And the Holy Spirit designed it so we can know God. So if you follow this cycle, more than likely, you'll come to know God. Let's break it down further into month by month. We'll start at Nisan. At Nisan, there are, on the 14th, Pesach. We don't do that. We do the next night, unleavened bread. From the 15th through the 21st of Nisan is Hagamatza, unleavened bread. Remember, we're going this way. That's Nisan, first month. And then the 17th, or the first Sunday after Passover, is Bikurim, first fruits. That's Nisan. And then comes the next month, Iyar. Uh, there's only two things in Iyar. There's the counting of the Omer, which started on Bikurim, and goes for 49, 50 days. Counting of the Omer goes through all of Iyar, and then the second Passover which is on the uh, 14th of Iyar. Then comes Shavuot in Sivan, Pentecost in Sivan in the third month. And we're going this way. Now we're in Sivan, May, June. And uh, we're at Shavuot. And then comes the fourth month, Tammuz. This is where we're at. <clears throat> this is where we're at now. We are, what do, I don't know what the date is. I think it's like the 21st of Tammuz. Seven, uh, Wednesday was the 17th. Thursday, Friday, oh, we're only three days after that, 19, 19, 20, yeah, 21st. Today's 21st of Tammuz. So all there is during this time is 17th of Tammuz. That's all there is. 17th was Wednesday. This is 19th. No, 17th was Wednesday. 18th, Thursday. 19th, Friday. Oh, 20th. Saturday, 20th. Today's 20th. All right, so then comes Av. Ninth of Av is all there is in Av. In the sweltering heat of summer when the temples were destroyed. Then comes month six, Elul. The whole month is a month of repentance, a month of Teshuvah, getting ready for the seventh month, which is the beginning of the new year. Now, this was the beginning of the new year. That is correct. This is the beginning of the new year. This is the beginning of the new year. Remember, God rotated the calendar in Exodus uh, uh, 13. Tishri used to be the first month. So in the Bible, all the way up to Exodus um, uh, chapter 13, Tishri was the first month. But then he rotated the calendar, and he made this the seventh month, and Nisan became the first month. Previous to Exodus 13, Nisan was the seventh month, so he reversed them. So there are two calendars going concurrently where the first is the last and the last is the first, or the first is the seventh and the seventh is the first. So we come to Tishri, the seventh month, Rosh Hashanah on the first, that was the creation of the world, Yom Kippur on the tenth, the Day of Atonement, the only day that anybody ever went in and saw God face to face. <coughs> The 15th through the 21st is Sukkot, Feast of Tabernacles. And then the day after that is Shemini Atzeret, which means the uh, eighth conclusion. And then Kislev, month number nine. Hanukkah is from the 25th through the end of uh, Kislev, the 30th. But it continues. It continues on into Tibet. The first three days of Tibet, which is the new moon, New moon of every month is the first three days. Tevet uh, is the new moon, uh, has the new moon of Tevet as Hanukkah. It's the end of Hanukkah. So Hanukkah is eight days. Starts on the 25th of Kislev, goes through the uh, third of Tevet. 
and then comes the 11th month, Shabbat. Now, Shabbat has another new year, the new year for trees. Uh, it's called Tubi Shabbat, which just means 15th of Shabbat, and it's the new year for trees. And then the last month of the year, Adar, which on the 13th and the 14th is Purim, when Amalek rose up to destroy, wipe out every Jew on the planet. Whoa, we just lost power, and it came back on. Is this still running? Okay, so um, there we go. So uh, it's when Amalek rose up to destroy all the Jews. Let's see if it goes off again. <laughs> and God saved the Jews. It's a repetition. It was repeated with Hitler's Germany. It was an absolute perfect repetition with Hitler's Germany, who is Amalek. And that's how we end the year. And then the day after, the day after Purim, we start cleaning out leaven and we start working toward the beginning of the year when we're going to have no leaven in the house, Passover comes, and then Hagamatsa, and we eat unleavened bread. All right. That's the cycle of the year. If you're not doing that, you don't know God. P pretty big blanket statement, right? But that's the truth. You may be born again, but you don't know God. You don't have an intimate relationship with Him. And the reason I say this is because you don't know what He feels. Are you feeling so angry that you could just spit and you want to know everything about Germany? Are you doing that? in Adar, because that's what God's feeling in Adar. If you're not, you're not in sync with God. The only way to be in sync with the Holy Spirit is do the Torah. It's the only way to be in sync with the Holy Spirit, because Torah and Spirit are one. I have finished my book, Torah and Spirit are One, and I'm currently printing it and um, I have everything in that book but this I have everything in that book but this so there are seven confirmations in the scriptures that Torah and Spirit are one I think this is a little too deep to follow because uh, without so much background it's impossible to tie John 3 8 in with Ecclesiastes 1.6 and to know what Yeshua was quoting. Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wills. Well, where does the wind, where, where does God will the wind to blow? In a circular cycle. You hear the sound of it, but you can't see where it comes from or where it's going. That's how everyone who's born of the Spirit is. They follow the cycle of the Spirit, the cycle of the wind. Blowing toward the south, then turning toward the north, the wind continues swirling along on its circular courses, the wind returns. So I would encourage you, if you want to know about what's coming, do Judaism. Start doing, and, and I've said this many times, you don't know what to do, pick something. Just get a Jewish prayer book and pick something. Don't, don't be so picky about it. No, I have to be led by the Spirit. Good. Be led by the Spirit. Go get a prayer book, open it up, start doing something. And the Holy Spirit will probably talk to you after you start learning what you're doing. This is why. Because you want to know what we are doing. This is what uh, the, uh, Israel was supposed to move into. They were supposed to move into the day of the Lord. Not necessarily a land, although, although they were given the land. The land was a picture of the kingdom, and they were supposed to know this, but they didn't. So God swore in his wrath, you shall not enter my menucha, my rest. That menucha, that rest, is God's Sabbath. It's the day of the Lord. If, for if Yeshua had given them rest, if Yehoshua, Joshua, had given them rest, he would not have spoken of another day, not land, after that. So there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. The one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. And when did God rest from his works? 
Seventh day, Shabbat. God has a Shabbat. It's a thousand years long. That's our hope. Not the coming of Christ. So, if you want to know what's going to happen in detail during that day, you have to do the rehearsals of the things that are going to happen in that day, which is the Jewish cycle of the year. So, let's, I'm going to sing this song again, I think. <clears throat> <laughs> it's not moving forward. Here we go. Torah and spirit are one. Remember, it says in Jeremiah 33, it doesn't say, and I will write the words of Christ on their heart. It says I will write the Torah in their hearts by the spirit I will write it in their hearts, write it on their inward parts, a covenant forevermore by the Spirit of the Living God. I delight to do your will, O oh God. Your Torah in my heart today, the Torah of the Torah, written by the Spirit of the Living God. You are a letter of Messiah, written by the finger of fire, engraved by the Torah on my heart. By the Spirit of the Living God. I'm going to do that again. You are a letter of Messiah, written by the finger of fire, engraved on the tablets of my heart. By the Spirit of the Living God. Apart from the spirit of the living God, Hesed and that mercy and truth, and that together love is the proof. With Torah in my heart, I'll never be apart from the spirit of the living God. I delight to do your will, O God. Hafasti la aso and sol ka. Your Torah in my heart today. The Torah ka, the Torah I. It is my the spirit of the living God. Torah and spirit are one. That's the only way that I've found to hear and feel what God is feeling when he's feeling it. To be in perfect sync with God. Shabbat Shalom.